Word to the wise. Immortality is no excuse not to floss. Welcome back, friends. I'm still a little sultry. Still a little holding on to some crud from Thanksgiving. But we're ready. We're back. And we have a special announcement. Very special announcement. We have a second Patreon member. And as promised, if you join a tier higher than the first tier, which in this case, it's the Night Knights, uh, special thanks to Ryan for joining our Patreon. Welcome, Ryan. Welcome, Ryan. It's good to have you here. <laughs> Welcome. We now have two Patreons because Matt stole the first Patreon glory all for himself. Uh, quality testing. Honey. Quality testing. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, so you could test out the Discord, which is up. The Discord is up, you guys. As well as the website. It is. And we can receive emails now. So you can send an email directly to me at Rachel at strange and beautiful dot club. Or you can email Matt at Matt at strange and beautiful dot club. Or if you want both of us to receive it, feel free to send it to the hosts at strange and beautiful dot club. All right. So the email is up. The website is up. Discord is up. Patreon membership numbers are up. We're trending upwards here at strange and beautiful book club. I finally did my job. <laughs> I can't use the Matt found the sensor button. So that's it. Like we're, it's all downhill from here. I don't know why I said trending upward because that's, that's it. We're trending downward. Now that he's found the sensor button. So here we are. We're going to start uh, forever night episode one. Oh, we're going to start season one, episode three of Forever Night, or For I Have Sinned, or as I like to think of it, Nick Knight versus Catholicism. So I guess we'll just get into it. I'm Matt. And I'm Rachel. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. Okay, so this one opens directly in the Raven. Uh, he's heading to see Jeanette, and we get the iconic finger dip from the intro scene where she, he goes to talk to her. She's got a glass in front of her, and she does the whole dip her finger in the glass and hold it up in front of his face uh, temptingly while there's a heartbeat playing in the background. And he resists um, whatever it is that's in this glass, which we can assume is blood. Although she says she mixes it with a little wine. So blood wine, I guess. And uh, we pan back into the club. And it's uh, Skinky. Skinky at Skinky. the club. Skinky in the Raven. What are you doing here? Wearing his uh, trench coat belted tightly. Does he have a sword? But his morals <laughs> less tightly. <laughs> his morals less tightly, yes. Because he spots a... Uh, Attractive woman with a beehive leaning against the counter. Well, a woman with a beehive. A woman with a beehive. Uh, we can assume she's supposed to be attractive. She's not unattractive. No, she's, she's good looking. No, yeah, but apparently she's tempting enough for Skanky because uh, as soon as she walks over, he gets a little riled up. Oh, yeah, he's ready for it. Yeah, and somebody comes and whispers in her ear and uh, she leaves. So he's left hanging. Poor Skanky. Skanky is under Nick's protection. Yeah, that's like... I think when what, Nick is there. I think that's what we're supposed to uh, get from this, that uh, he's hands off because he's Nick's buddy, which begs the question, 
Is the raven a common place where humans come in, get eaten, and then uh, get dispensed with? That feels like uh, a trend. Yeah, they don't really establish if vampires can feed from a human and then just let them go. So in season one, there's an episode where uh, they talk about somebody just biting somebody. And Nick says, yeah, if you want to be a zombie. Um, but we never, that like that's the only illusion. And then we have several flashbacks where he has uh, women that he has been courting and they have what are clearly like fang scars on their neck. So it's obvious he's been at least partially feeding on them and then letting them go with no consequences. So one can assume, uh, I guess, that it's possible to partially feed on, just to enjoy the moment and then move on. But anyway. You have to be the pullout king. Yeah, you have to be the pullout king. I can <laughs> We didn't have to bring Jeff Goldblum into this. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, so anyway, Skanky's in the club. and Check uh, out Portlandia if you haven't seen it. <laughs> he, uh, he gets interrupted in more ways than one. And uh, they head back out, out to the street. And we miss out on Nick sucking on Jeanette's finger. Yeah, we do. Although Jeanette licks her own finger. So if that's a metaphor... There you go. That I think that's a huge metaphor <laughs> for Nick and Jeanette's relationship it in is. this show. It is. Although we will get a little a little some some eventually, but that's not happening right now. She gets she tempts him, but he he morals his way out of it. And they head out into the street. With his huge morality. His huge morality. And Skanky gets his uh my father cheated. My grandfather cheated. It's, it's in, in my, my jeans. jeans. That is grade A action in there. You're just selfish. Look, you're a married man, Skanky. Hey, listen. My father fooled around. His father fooled around. It's a family tradition. Oh, yeah? No, I don't think you got it in you. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Is that right? You don't think I got it in me? No, I don't. Well, I'm telling you, it's in the genes. Ha! <laughs> Which Nick, uh, Nick thinks is pretty funny. So Skanky reveals that the reason he went into the club it's because someone has been calling them on the radio because there's a new body, which Nick went to the club because there's been a couple of murders. And the only reason apparently he talks to Jeanette is because she might know something about the murders, which she's super pissed about because she's like, oh, he came to visit me. That's so nice. And he's like, oh, so somebody got decapitated and somebody got disemboweled. Do you know anything about that? And she's like, God damn it. Do you think I know about everybody who gets disemboweled around here? Honestly, Jeanette probably does, but she's really disinclined to discuss this with him at all. So apparently there's a third body now, which is where they head after they leave the club. And this one has been crucified, which she staked to the pavement. I don't know. What's the technical definition for crucifixion? Do you have to be put up on a cross? Yeah, I think the the process of crucifixion is being stretched out and hung vertically because it uh, stops you, basically stops you from taking a deep breath. Yeah, I was going to say the whole process is pretty much less less immediate death, more... It's not about the holes in your hands and feet. Right. It's, it's about the compression. prolonged... Chest compression. And then you can't chest really expansion. push yourself yeah. upright in order to well, take a Well, you deep have breath. to push yourself upright on the stake right, through can't your feet because there's a stake through your feet. Well, so. you can, but you have to go through excruciating pain yeah. in your feet to take a breath. Anyway, there's a lot involved in crucifixion, which I don't think we get as part of being staked to like a parking lot. It, it's a symbolic crucifixion, right? Which Nick immediately is like, Oh yeah, she didn't die of crucifixion. And Skanky's like, well, how do you know? And he goes, there's not enough blood. There's not enough blood. There's not enough blood. I guess. He's been around. He's seen And crouches pensively next to the chalk outline. Yeah, but then he gets a little bit of, like, dramatic head whipping. We get, like, let's get her covered and get her out of here. And then he, like, walks away, and Skanky tries to 
calm him down and he like head whips back to the side and they see the guy leaning against the car and it's the security guard that this particular woman was having a little bit of something on the side something on the side at the furniture store yeah at the very beginning because we get like an intimate moment an intimate moment right at the beginning and then as they pan out you see that there's a red tag sale tag on the lamp on the lamp um but this security guard missed it because she had left. She was outside. Um, and we get the dramatic hand holding the cross. And he says, you don't deserve to wear this. Which is our first introduction to the fact that this entire episode is going to center around Nick's issues with organized religion. I mean, fair, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> fair. Uh, so, in... Continuing Nick versus Catholicism, uh, Nick gets a little bit, we get a little bit deeper into the mythology of vampires in this season and the fact that crosses harm them, like physically harm them, because he tries to hold a cross and he actually gets like a burn mark in his palm. And we actually get part of our flashback for this season or for this episode. Right, he- he sets the cross down in his hand yeah. and clenches it tightly. And that's the precursor to our flashback. Right, which the, the flashback for this episode is uh, Joan of Arc. Because apparently Nick met Joan of Arc. He didn't only meet Joan of Arc, he offered to turn Joan of Arc into a vampire. He knew her well enough that they had enough rapport that he felt comfortable offering her Real immortality. Right. I mean, they they spoke on several occasions, which Nick has a knack. Nick has a knack for being in the right place at the right time, historically speaking. It's a uh, convenient plot device. It's a convenient, yeah, a plot device or just uh, no vampire. I mean, if he'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time, wouldn't have made good flashbacks. I'm like, well, I don't have anything to say about this. I don't have any commentary on the Catholic Church because I spent this entire time um, living in an apartment in an obscure city in Europe that had nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Which I do like stories about immortal slash extremely long-lived characters. And then you have the inevitable, oh, well, what were you doing? Who did you meet during this historical period? Uh, no one. I was, I was off in this village. No one, because the chances of me being involved in all of these historically significant events is astronomically small. But thanks for asking. Right. However, he did meet uh, Joan of Arc, which this actress is going to go on to be the main character in a vampire television show. A vampire detective show. Yes, Blood Ties, uh, which is based on a book by Tanya Huff. Um, it's a pretty good series. I think it's on Netflix in its entirety. It didn't make it past season one, but it's pretty good. Yeah. I, I think it's short enough. We could review it on the podcast without yeah. too much trouble. She's actually going to show back up in forever night. So this isn't the last time we're going to see her. Last time we're going to see her as Joan of Arc. Right. Because when you had weekly syndicated television that you couldn't replay on demand, there was very little chance that you'd have people that had seen it and paid enough attention to recognize repeat roles yeah. for the same. We're actors. gonna get a couple recycled kiss, recycled actresses and actors, and this one in particular, she gets recycled at least once. Um, and then we go to the Catholic Church, and we're in the confessional, and someone has arrived at the confession, but they don't want to confess anything. They really are just there to kind of tout the fact that they've been murdering all these women that have, quote, profaned the church. And the priest in this scene plays in another one of my favorite Canadian television shows. Another show that we may have to do on the podcast. Lex. Uh, if you don't just know for, Lex. Just for the <laughs> euphemism <laughs> and s- s- the symbolism in the show. Yeah. 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 So he plays like a, uh, 
undead assassin guy with a magnificently high beehive who uh, his entire people have been dead for like thousands of years. He's the last one. Right. And he's working for the bad guy and she just brings him out of hypersleep or whatever, uh, whenever he needs to kill somebody. And so he finally breaks free uh, in Lex and he joins the crew of a ship, which is improbably space shaped like a dragonfly. Mm-mm-mm. But uh, uh, no, it's supposed to be a dragonfly. Imagine a dragonfly <laughs> with no wings <laughs> that flies backwards. Yeah, two large spheres with a central uh, shaft, one might say. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lex is worth checking out. Nigel Bennett is in Lex. Yeah, he plays a character in Lex. So anyway, that's it's been all I'll a while. say about it, that. I think it's worth a rewatch. Yeah, so the murderer is there to confess is what we're getting at and here. And the, <laughs> the priest is the the undead assassin from Lex. Yeah. So it, with one of the thickest Canadian accents. So, oh my God, so thick, right? Just, he's hitting every OU, just, it's crisp. It's like peak Canadian accent happening here, like Toronto accent. Um, and the murderer confesses to him. Um, but of course, he's bound by the seal of the confessional. Right, and so this is an interesting workaround to the, like a hallmark of psychopaths, uh, especially like psychopathic serial killers, is they they feel a compulsion to, for other people to know what they did, right? And so you, a lot of times that leads to them leaving some kind of um, trophy. Trophy uh, or a, like a marker at yeah, the scene. Yeah, a calling card. A calling card. Uh, so they either leave a calling card, they leave some kind of clues, they write letters to the police, something like that. In this case, this guy, he's the hand of God. Yeah, I hold the keys of perdition and of death. I hold the keys of perdition and of death. <laughs> Which the he must have been like justice. super proud of that line because he says it at least multiple twice. times. Multiple times, yeah. And and here's this situation. He can honestly talk about what he's been doing to another person who, uh, if they're true to their faith, literally can't say anything to anybody else. Ever. Ever. Yeah. Which he tries to get around it. He talks to another priest. He's like, so say, for instance, somebody was confessing that they were a while now going to kill their wife or something. Uh, no, nope, you can't do it. And he's like, no, you can't do anything that would. Reveal the identity of the sinner. Yes. So he gives him a little wiggle room. A little bit of wiggle room. And then we have Natalie, who this is, she has a very brief, couple of very brief scenes in this episode. Yeah, she gets less than a minute of screen time. Yeah, but she's basically saying, um, hey, I missed it. These guys all had crosses on and they're all Catholic. And so Nick is like, ah, shit. <laughs> crosses. Um, And in this episode, uh, it's very obvious that Nick has a bad history with Catholicism. Yeah, Nick's not loving the whole religious angle. He's antagonistic against the priest that he meets and, like, every very religious person that he meets. Yeah, he's borderline villainous, almost. Like, he's he's super antagonistic. He's almost harassing them. Yeah. Which, I mean, he fought in the, the Crusades. To the detriment of the case. Yeah, he fought in the Crusades. So if anybody's going to be... Disillusioned, disillusioned about... about religion. It's yeah. somebody who's fought in the Crusades. Uh, but he is apparently disillusioned enough that he literally takes an evidence bag back to his apartment. Because we get this funny little scene where he's like face down on a counter next to a bottle of garlic pills. And he like very dramatically takes this garlic pill. And then we get like a point of view camera where he's like holding a handy camera against his face as he like thrashes about his apartment, accidentally lights his fireplace. Um, With the remote control. With the remote control, obviously. Uh, He falls on the remote control and it lights his fireplace, which is a... Which is a good thing he didn't hit the button button that opens his blinds. (laughs) So we would have had a real fire. Uh, But he, he does like eventually recover as right Genki so the garlic pills are part of his 
his treatment plan. Yes, from Natalie. Because to Natalie is restore his, his uh, humanity. He's put a lot of faith in Natalie and her ability to suss out what he needs to do to uh, restore his humanity. It's like iocane powder. You just have to <laughs> consume a little bit of it over a long period of time to gain immunity. I mean, that's what we're going with. That's why he's taking these. Uh, so then he he takes the garlic pill uh, for whatever reason, and he ends up recovering enough that he pulls an evidence bag out of a, like... It was just in a bowl on his <laughs> coffee a table. bowl on his coffee table. And I saw a plastic bag there, and I thought... He doesn't have an evidence bag at his apartment, does he? Yeah, and it and says, then he lifts it up, and it just says evidence. It literally says evidence bag, and then at the bottom it has chain of custody, where you're supposed to fill out the chain of custody on this bag, and it's just blank, because you know he probably just was like, Loop, and he just took which it. Which is fitting with the trend for crime scene logistics. Yeah, we have not watched show. a good like. <laughs> Anything we've watched. We watched Highlander where the guy spilled coffee on the corpse. We watched Nick Knight where there was like 155 people in the crime scene. We watched the last episode of Forever Night where Skanky was literally straddling the corpse. We have not gotten a good example of just like police crime scene discipline yet. Thinking about that, like what would happen in a supernatural story if the police were actually like good at their jobs. And so that makes me think of in the Dresden files, the police department is fairly good at their job. And the result of that, the result of the police being good at their job in a city where there's all the supernatural stuff happening around Harry Dresden is that the police department has created a special division <laughs> to handle the cases where weird shit happens. Yeah. And the entire purpose of this division is to sweep stuff under the rug, glaze over reports and evidence handling so that the higher up levels of the police department are not like very aware of how weird things are. So everything just kind of fits into the paperwork and the police department can just run business as usual. And then you have these like psychologically traumatized police officers <laughs> who've been having to handle all this like werewolf stuff and whatever. So it's probably a, a trope because yeah. if you had a competent police department, they'd pick up on this stuff pretty quickly. Well, I guess maybe Nick is the department of one then in the sweeping under the he's, rug department. He's the special division. Yeah, he's the special division in charge of keeping everybody from realizing that there's a huge Toronto vampire population. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But anyway, he's a clearly skilled at stealing evidence because he has this evidence bag. And he pours it out into his hand. The, the, he puts the cross in his hand. And uh, he in his flashback with Joan of Arc, after they have kind of a loaded discussion about the fact that because he lives forever, he lives in constant fear of death because he knows where he's going. And he tries to touch the cross and his hand bursts into flames. But in modern times, when he takes the cross out of the bag, he just gets mildly burned because apparently the garlic is helping. So Natalie's onto something, at least a little well, bit. It's, it's not just the garlic. It's the, the process. Yeah. Natalie's treatment is helping. Meanwhile, Skanky is trying to get a little, a little something. He's trying to live up to his genes yeah, or so his bravado about his genes. So while Nick is trying to reassure himself of his upward trending path towards morality, Skanky is attempting to reassure himself that he's comfortable getting a little something on the side. So he goes back to the club. Right. Skanky thinks he deserves it and that there's something fun about it. I think he's just curious. I think he's curious yeah. about why Nick keeps going. Plus, he's partnered up with this guy who's like super fun, judgy, fun, fancy free and single and, and super judgy. Skanky yeah. is married and he does have a child, which we don't talk about very often. In fact, we're never going to see his wife ever. 
We're never going to hear her voice. We're going to see her like in the background, kind of later. But no, we never see Myra ever. Um, but Skanky goes to the club and he finds the same girl again. And this time there's nobody to stop her from. Because Nick isn't there. Getting a little frisky. And Jeanette's a little busy. Yeah. So they try dancing, which poor Skanky. <laughs> he just looks like. He's trying really hard. He's like, I can't believe I'm even dancing to this well, stuff. He dances just like me, honey. What do you mean? It, it would be like if a millennial showed up at a Gen Z club and they're all like, please stop. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. As the millennial in the scenario, I feel like I can say that. Uh, so he <laughs> he ends up uh, dancing with her and she turns around and she has the like vampire eye contacts. And she's like, what else goes with dancing? He's like, uh dining she's like i had something else in mind Uh, and she takes him to the back room and uh she's taking and starts undressing him yeah taking his tie off things are getting a little hot and heavy and jeanette shows up and she's like uh skanky e g t f o no (laughs) at first she says alma oh yeah alma get off of him right and then she's like don't come back skanky get out and don't come back he's if you had followed through on this let's just say the consequences would have been fatal so they have and a he's bit like of, you mean i might have caught <laughs> they have a moment of uh miscommunication where she's trying to say like this chick would have killed you and what skanky hears is venereal disease <laughs> so <laughs> he dips one way or the other um and then uh we Get a scene where Nick confronts the priest, uh, Father Rochefort. Yeah, outside the church. Outside the church. And he's like, oh, come inside. It's cold. Nick's like, no, no, it's fine. I don't mind I don't the mind the weather. Yeah. yeah. So they, you know, they take a look at the crime scene photos or photos of the victims, whichever one he shows them. And uh, he's like, yeah, I know these. I buried them all. And Nick is kind of peak judgy right now. So he's not really hearing him. He's just like, do you know more than you're saying? And the priest is like, well, if I did, there isn't anything I could say about it. So Nick takes off because, you know, he's not getting anything out of Rochefort the way he wants to. And so apparently as he's driving, he very conveniently hears something happening. And it's, uh, oh yeah, because... Magda, the next victim, works at a phone sex hotline called Loose Lips. <laughs> and she's, uh, she receives a phone call, a disturbing phone call, which she luckily records. Um, and the guy uses his line, um, I hold the keys to perdition and to death. And she's like, oh, my God, this guy's threatening me. And her boss is like, meh. Freaks. Yeah, she plays it back for her boss. Like, she's that ah, freaks are our business, is what she said. And so she's like, you know what? Oh, you're not good to me like this. You go. And so as she's leaving, you know, we get the like suspenseful walking out where she's checking around the corners and getting a little spooked by the guy polishing the floors. And then as she goes to step into the stairwell, somebody walks up behind her and grabs her. So she starts screaming, which Nick conveniently is like, <gasps> Driving by in his caddy. I hear it. With his super hearing. Right. So he gets out, listens for a few minutes more, and then just takes off into the air, which we get like a feet foot, lift off the ground. Feet yeah. lift off the ground scene to imply that he's like we didn't know he was flying. Like the handy cam pan up the side of the building and over the top and off into the sky wouldn't have been enough for us to know he was flying. We need the like foot lifting off the, off the pavement scene. Uh, so he senses Magda's in trouble and he flies and he comes in through like a skylight, which nobody questions. He's like on the roof and he like jumps down this ladder and then he gets shot, like shot through his stomach and he's holding it. And she's like, Oh my God, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, go call 911. Uh, just to get her out of the room because right, she, she runs, runs up the stairs and he and like, he runs after the, yeah, he vamp chases guy. Yeah. the guy. Well, and I think he's, I think he's deliberately holding back from doing too much vampire stuff. Cause he could have just caught the guy. Yeah. But he runs at like 
human like speed. Well, he's been taking garlic pills. And then it's off his game. He's using his gun as his primary weapon. Right, which he holds upright. As Matt was like, good, good gun discipline, Dick. Because he doesn't hold it pointed at the ground at all. He's literally just like right. He's just holding it, it like in yeah. front of his chest, kind of pointed up at an angle, while he's running. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah, but he does catch the guy. We think at the end of an alley, but he turns around. Right, he sees a guy in like a leather coat with some kind of black thing on and his head. And he actually has like a balaclava in his hand, like he's taken it off. Well, he, like he took as he's off. lifting his hands up to say, don't shoot, he takes the toboggan off. And it's not like a full face mask, like ski mask. It's just, just a toboggan. Just a toboggan. Right. So it, but it's the priest. It's Father Rochefort. Uh-oh. Is Father Rochefort the bad guy? Oh, no. Oh, no. But it can't possibly be because of the confession earlier. So. uh uh-huh. Let's go back to Pandorum. <laughs> it's a very useful uh, mechanism. Yes, it could have been a uh, disassociative event. Yeah. yeah that's possible. But uh, well, anyway. That was my first thought. So we get back to the um, interrogation room. But then he sounded too Canadian, and I thought, nah. Nah. He, it's not him. I mean, he's, he is so Canadian. <laughs> but uh, uh, There's almost like a throat swallow noise oh, when he's it's, talking. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's intense. It's, I mean, it's good. I mean, you get where you are, right? I mean, it's fine. They're in Canada. You should have a Canadian accent. Which in Lex makes him sound almost exotic. Yeah. Compared to everyone else. Anyway, back yeah. to so we're Forever in the night. We're in the interrogation room and Nick is just feeling judgy. Like he's feeling himself. He's like aggressively Harassing antagonistic. The priest again. To the point Harassing where Stone, the priest again. To the point where Stone Tree kicks him out. Of the interrogation room. He's like, that's it. You're out. You got to get out of here. What for that? Next woman that's murdered, you come along when I tell the family. You better tell the family yourself. All right, that's it. Night, you're out of here. Fine. Magda attempts to, like, confront Nick in the hallway. She's like, hey, let's set up a sting. Like, I could, I can help you. And he's like, you know what? No, thanks. <laughs> Magda gets really offended. I mean, she's offering to help. And he's like, yeah, we don't. We don't need your help. What are you going to do? You got you to catch him, Magda? I mean, he's really just like, he's not in a mood where he's feeling and sympathetic towards anybody. Right. He's being, he's feeling so antagonistic against the church that it hurts the case. Right. And he storms off down the hallway. Right. He storms off stage left. Right. And then we zoom in on the priest talking to Magna. And if you pay attention, Nick sneaks back behind the priest. Yeah. And then... Magda and the priest turn around, and Nick is there. Right, because he's <laughs> After talking. he stormed off stage left. Yeah, he stormed in the wrong direction, because he has to come back and start, talk to Stone Tree. So he tries to, like, walk it back a little by literally walking back a little. And then he's standing next to Stone Tree when they confront him again. And then Magda actually leaves. This is an interesting, like, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle that's going on here, because Nick storms off in the wrong direction. And then while they're having the conversation, Nick sneaks back behind them so that when they turn around, Nick is standing there with Stone Tree and Magda is talking to them. But then we zoom into just Stone Tree talking to Nick and Rochefort and Magda's not there. But Magda has like walked back to the like the end of the hallway because Nick or Rochefort turns around and goes back and talks to her. And she's like at the far end of the hallway. So this is a really like linear like hallway scene that's happening here where all of these characters yeah are there's like, like weird choreography right it's a continuous shot so they're all having to move around in this hallway to be in the right position at the right time and they're kind of relying on you not paying attention to anybody but the main right. actors just talking. focus on the face in the center of the screen yeah it's it's really it's really I didn't notice that probably the last 15 times I've watched this episode. Right. And once again, when this was, you know, syndicated weekly episode, you couldn't rewind. You couldn't be like, "Wait, how did Nick get there?" Let me right. rewind 20 seconds. It's just seconds. like, "Oops, suddenly Nick." Um so we we end this kind of interesting whatever's happening in the hallway here. Uh with Natalie and Nick are talking in his apartment and he's pulled out this cross and we find out that not only did Nick meet Joan of Arc once 
twice, but the third time he met her was when she was getting ready to be burned at the stake. And she gave him a special gift. She gave him a special gift, which was her cross, her special cross, which is really just like two pieces of wood tied together with like a leather thong thing. Um, But hey, I mean, she was poor. So this was her cross and he's had it with him for who knows how long. And he's showing it to Natalie and she's like, oh my God, is this really Joan of Arc's cross? He's like, yeah, would I lie? I'm kind of a big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. (laughs) But he's got this shirt on. I just want to address this shirt for a moment because it's we, like we were talking about faith. Yeah, I mean, and this, it takes it would take a lot of faith to wear that shirt. Yeah, this just this whole discussion for this whole episode is really about faith and Nick's faith and what he wants to do with it. Does he have it? Has he reclaimed it? Has he lost it? Whatever. We're tossing faith. Is around it a enough lot. to is wear this black button up shirt with three wavy lines of? Like almost reflective white material. Yeah, it's like silver embroidery. But this shirt, I think, proves that Nick has what it takes <laughs> to become mortal because nobody without like giant supernatural balls could wear this like 90s. He has the conviction. Because he's got black pants on and then it's a black shirt. But oh no, you thought it ended there. It's like zigzaggy, like you know the cut from the like iconic '90s like icon yeah, with the the wavy line, the squiggle. Yes, but on a shirt. Yeah, I mean it's a lot. It's a look. It's a look. It's almost as good as the purple like members only jacket that we're gonna get here pretty soon. Does that become a signature outfit piece for him? Uh, until he gets shot with like an Uzi. Yeah. Oh, but when he's in the hallway with Magda, she's like, oh, my God, are you OK? Because remember, she saw him get shot. Oh, and yeah. he's like, yeah. oh, she, no, I just got grazed. He's at, he's at the police station. She comes in the hallway. And this is before the weird choreography in the hallway scene. Uh, or this is the beginning of it. And she's like, oh, my God, Detective Knight, I've been looking all over for you. And he's like, oh, why? What's up? Detective Knight, I've been looking all over for you. Are you OK? What do you mean, what? I just saw you get shot. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just grazed. Uh, I'll be all right. Thanks for asking. Well, you got shot, and he's like, oh, yeah. It's just a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> just a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound. He did, meanwhile, he's clearly got a bullet hole, like, right his, through his abdomen. So he's wearing, is it like a jersey shirt it, underneath? It's like a button-up the, shirt Okay, he's so got he's, on. Yeah. He's got his shirt on, and... Or yeah, like, like a Henley to, movie. To the side of his belly button, there's literally a hole and a circular blood stain. <laughs> and the way he's standing, his jacket is just open. Yeah. Like, oh no, it just grazed me. This continues our theme of Nick doing fuck all to keep anybody from... De- no, the, I'm shocked he doesn't just take off into the air in front of like... Everybody, anybody, all the everybody's. I mean, he gets shot through the stomach. He holds his wound like he's injured, tells her to go call 911. And then when she checks on him, he hasn't changed his shirt. He hadn't made any effort to obfuscate the fact that he'd been shot through the stomach. He's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, it just grazed me. Meanwhile, it's like near his belly button. That scene in the stairwell where he got shot and told her to go call 911 or like get an ambulance. He covers it with his hand. Right? Yeah. That's probably the most subterfuge I've seen him engage in. Right. To hide his vampiric nature. Yeah, bare fucking minimum. That's what he did. And he was like, whoops, yeah. uh, Can you go call 911? I think I might have gotten shot. And then when she sees him again, he's like, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It happens to me all the time. Like, I have bullet wounds. I have bullet holes in every shirt. It's fine. It's fine. Like in the movie, Nick Knight, he says, oh, yeah, I, I wear it to remind me of Right, I got it off a danger. drug dealer. Yeah. It reminds me of my own mortality. Well, anyway, that's Nick for you. Uh, so we go back. The reason we're to, to go back forward to where we're talking to Natalie and we have the cross, the reason she's, she's like, why are we doing this right now? Is there a reason why we're talking about the cross right now? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to spend the day in the church apparently his grand plan for catching this killer because he's a little emotionally involved in this not thinking straight is that he's going to go 
at dawn and then spend the entirety of the sunlit hours of his day in this church. Not having canvassed the church, ascertained whether or not there's light proof enough areas for it's him. It's a bold strategy. It's a bold strategy. And we'll see strategy. if it works out for him. <laughs> hint, hint. It kind of does, kind of doesn't. So we have my one of my favorite shots, which is when we see the church and then we pan over and he's standing there and he has his collar popped and it's like dawn. So it's fairly bright and he's looking at the church. And I love this profile shot that we have of Garrett Wynn Davies right here. Because it's like season one for like boyish attractiveness. It's definitely peak Garrett. And this scene is where we get a lot of it. I mean, he just looks really nice standing here staring at the church. And it's kind of a character moment for us for Nick because we've only met him in Dark Knight. And he's really not the Nick we're going to know for the next two and a majority seasons. So this is really our first episode of Forever Night, if you want to think of it that way. So this is a good character building moment for him. And meanwhile, in the background, Skanky is making a phone call. And apparently he's called Myra and he woke her up. From a payphone. From a payphone. And he's like, what was he going to do? Call her from a cell phone? He had to call her from a payphone. And she's like, well, why'd you wake me up? Which is what we infer, because of course we don't hear Myra's voice. And he's like, well, I know. I know it's like not even sunrise yet, but I just want to call and tell you I loved you. Which she's having none of. And so he hangs up and then Nick says. There's an old Italian saying, Skanky. When a man sends his wife flowers for no reason, there's usually a reason. Well, there's another old Italian saying, get out of my face. There's an old Italian saying, when a man shows up with flowers for no reason. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. <laughs> Which Keiki says, there's another old Italian saying, get out of my face. <laughs> Why don't you get up off my back about it? <laughs> uh, and at this point, Nick doesn't know why Skanky's making this phone call, but... He's got enough relationship experience. He's got enough emotional ballast. He knows. He knows something's going on. But he's got bigger fish to fry, and that's spending the entire day in this church. So he walks in the church, and immediately he's, like, sick. Like, the the camera's wavy. And... He has a PTSD flashback to <laughs> Joan of Arc. Right, and he's, like, flopping around. on the. He's, like, rolling sideways along the pews, and he, like... He tries to run out the front door, opens the door, sunlight blast in. <laughs> he has to like he is flip already. around. He's yeah. been in the church for like two minutes. Uh, yeah. And he's, he's already he's about almost to die. killed himself. So he looks over and sees a convenient, small, isolated little room that he could spend the day in. And so he runs over, opens the door, falls into it. And of course, it's the priest side of the confessional. And here he is for the remainder of the day. So we get kind of a funny moment where he's sitting in the confessional and somebody comes in to confess their yeah, sins. Yeah, some indeterminate amount of time later. Yeah, and uh, she she starts, you know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. No he, response. He doesn't respond because, of course, he's not a priest. He's not trying to be an actual asshole about this. He just, it was too much to handle, so he's hiding out in here. So he pretends to be asleep. And he, like, snores. Snoring noise. Yeah. Father? Father, I know you're there. I can see your profile. Why don't I just say 20 Hail Marys and let you nod? He nods. And so she leaves. Um, and we don't get any other funny parishioner things, but... We do so get... another indeterminate amount of time later. Skanky's feeling kind of antsy in the car. He gets out. He's looking around. Uh, does he call somebody on the radio? No, I think he just like, gets. It. He's like something? drinking his coffee, and he gets out. And uh, apparently, his conscience has finally got to him. He's like aggressively nonchalant. Right. So he saunters on into the church and into the confessional. Uh, because he's got something he needs to confess. And it's the uh, the night out at the Raven that he had the night before. So he says, you know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And Nick immediately perks up because it's like, oh, this is going to be good. 
<laughs> so and he's he's totally here for this. Yeah. So Gar unveils like a Irish accent. How long has it been since your last confession, my son? About two years. I know I haven't been a good Christian father. I'm probably a, a lousy Christian by your standards, but last night I did something I don't know, Father. I, I just don't know. You can speak freely, my son. Well, I've been married now for ten years, and all that time I've been good. I'm not the type of guy to, uh, to, uh, fool around. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. Which is decent. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, he pulls it off. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty decent. Yeah. <laughs> He apparently disguises his voice enough that Skanky doesn't know that it's him. But And then Skanky's like, there was this woman, it was Alma or Yvonne. I don't know what her name is. And Nick says, it was Alma. <laughs> and it's then Skanky Alma. gets su- suspicious. Yeah. And he's like, oh, she was coming on to me like I was some kind of Greek. God. Because <laughs> he realizes it's Nick. So he opens the door and he runs over and he like pulls open the door to confront Nick and Nick is giving zero fucks. He's like, he's still just <laughs> laid back, chilling on the bench and just flawlessly continuing this Irish accent yeah. with no hesitation. Yeah. He's like 20 Hail Marys and promise me you'll never go in there again. Number one, I thought I told you to stay away from there. Number two. You're supposed to cover this place from the outside. You son of a... 20 Hail Marys. Promise you'll never go in there again. So this is a... I love this skanky Nick moment. I mean, I love skanky and Nick together, just as a whole. But the bromance of this moment, they haven't been together that long. They haven't been partners that long. They just got partnered up. And we got a little hint of kind of their rapport at the very beginning when Skanky's trying to convince Nick that cheating is in his in his lineage. And Nick's like, whatever, right? Sure, Skanky, you're a, a ladies' man. Uh, but this is so good. This, like, this, this interaction right here is so good. Which, uh, okay, so after this interaction um, and, like, him calling his wife at 6 a.m., I realized in... Dark Knight, the first episode, when they get paired up, he's like, oh, you know, it's just for a couple shifts. I'll be working the day shift or whatever. But now it's kind of implied that they are partners and Skanky has shifted to the night shift. They to overlap work with sometimes. Him all the time. They don't overlap other times because like earlier when he was called when we had the evidence bag and we were about to like hold the cross skanky's calling and he's like look i'm gonna be asleep so don't call me oh god so he might he's working sw- swing shift i was gonna say he it's might even swing worse shift. yeah so, so i think if the case is big enough he moves to night shift but if he can stay on the day shift he stays on the day shift although they they tend to over and nick is very rarely alone skanky's almost always with him so I guess we can kind of assume that Skanky's moved, but that's it. Kind of is left uh, ambiguous. You're not sure if Skanky is, and that way it's uh, plausible for Nick to have uh, alone time whenever yeah. it's necessary for the plot. Right, Skanky may work from like noon to midnight. That's kind yeah, of yeah. Th- there may be like three or four hours of yeah, overlap. Yeah, that's the but general not sense I get is that like he full. works a little, he does a little daytimes because sometimes they'll regroup, and Skanky will have gone off and interviewed people. He'd be like, "Well, I talked to this guy or I talked to that guy or whatever," and clearly he did it during the day when Nick wasn't there because not everybody's available during Nick's hours. So I think Skanky kind of works whatever Nick can, and Nick works the early morning hours when Skanky doesn't. Although they end up being at this church from dawn until after dark and then we have a series of events and at the very end skanky's like hey you know let's let's go do something or whatever and nick's oh, like let's go get something to eat yeah and nick's like can't sun's coming up so we've clearly and gone he dramatically from, puts on sunglasses yes, he dramat- <laughs> of course he does but we go from dawn to dusk to dusk to dawn so they've apparently been on duty for 24 hours 
Well, I think Nick napped a little bit in the confessional. Oh, yeah. He definitely slept in the confessional. But the, the priest uh, confronts him after this. I don't know if Skanky tattled or what, but the priest guy, he comes out of the confessional. I think, I think it's implied that the priest sees Nick come out of the priest side of the confessional. Yeah, because he comes out and he's kind of wheeling around, clearly not well. And the priest, uh, Father Rochefort, is trying to um, talk to him about it, confront him about the fact that he has violated the confessional by um, snoozing in there all day. Uh, which, this is a busy church. I don't know. I'm not Catholic. Weigh in. Are it's you a, Catholic? It's a Catholic church. You're not. I'm not asking you. I'm asking the audience. Are you Catholic? Are they really busy like this? Because in Highlander, it's a Catholic church, and it's like bustling. And then we have this one, and it's it's pretty busy. I mean, there's people in and out. I guess it needs to be available if you have to confess. You have to be available all the time, every day. Big city Catholic church. I guess. Well, and it's pretty bustling. Anyway, but he comes it, especially out. Especially, it's a walking city. Yeah, and Nick is, like, sick. Like, he's obviously uncomfortable. And Father Rochefort's trying to confront him about it, and he, like, drags him closer to the cross. Like, Nick is trying to get out because the sun is set. And he, like, grabs his arm and pulls him up towards the cross, and Nick uh, faints, <laughs> faints into his arms dramatically and so then we cut out to skanky and skanky's like hey is nick okay in there and then nick calls him over the radio and he's like yeah i'm doing fine and uh skanky's like well i heard there's bratwurst in there <laughs> so nick oh, did i hear something about bratwurst and sauerkraut yeah did i hear something about bratwurst so nick's like hey, i'll send you out a plate he's like oh, well thanks uh but then he gets punched in the face <laughs> and he passes out which apparently this killer is one punch man one Punch Man, yeah, because he just knocks Skanky right out. And oh, right after Skanky sees Magda, because Magda had been taken to a safe house, which she flirted her way out of. Cause she she made, made the cop so uncomfortable. Yeah, that he was like, you know what, I'll wait out in the hallway while you take this shower, because you're a little much. <laughs> Asking me to scratch your back. Coming here. on a little strong. Yeah, rub, wash my scrub. back. Scrub, 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 yeah. scrub her back. Uh, so he sees Magda, gets punched in the face, and then we have, like, plot, 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 and Magda ends uh, up... Uh, it's a fairly short amount of time. Yeah. And then the guy comes out with the plate and sees... That Skanky's, Skanky's passed, out. passed out. Yeah. And Skanky immediately reports, Magda's in the church. Right. I mean, he's got his eye on the prize. He could have said anything. He's like, oh, thanks, Bratwurst. But no, he wakes up Once and he's again, like, Magda, Skanky's I saw Magda. Skanky's actually working in the case. Yeah. Uh, so Nick has recovered and he ends up see here Magda screaming something happens but he knows Magda's over at this like Easter display that they've made with a cross and apparently they're planning to burn it because they've stuffed a brush underneath yeah the, cross. the scenes that we've had or he of did them. he could have stuffed the brush underneath the cross I uh, no, we see um when Rochefort is talking to the other priest, Rochefort has a bundle of sticks, or the other priest does, the other and priest wraps does. it up and stacks it on this pile of, you know, tinder. Right, because the other priest is wearing his, like, priest suit coat or suit jacket. Yeah, or shirt, the collar thing. Shirt and collar underneath. Overalls. Overalls. <laughs> Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe they had a big pile of brush, but it wasn't directly underneath the cross. So I'm wondering if the bad guy, uh, anyway, he's going to light her on fire. Let's just get yeah, so Nick, Nick came in with the other police officers after the guy who brought the plate out found Skanky and Skanky said Magda's in the church. So they all came in the church looking for Magda and found Magda's like coat and stuff. Yeah. And so Nick says, uh, secure the building or seal the exits seal or the whatever. Exits, yeah. I'm going outside. And so he goes outside and because he needs to be the hero. Oh, uh, yeah. On, guys. Yes. Always first on the scene, which Skanky eventually gets mad at. He's like, oh, well, that's Nick. Always first on the scene. Always taking the bad guy down by himself. But, uh, well, or, Skanky can't fly. So Nick hears Magda. Well, he's headed outside. Yeah, he's headed outside. But he, he heads directly to where she's being tied to this cross, which we can assume he heard her. He hears everything, apparently. He can hear damsels in distress from miles away. So he goes directly to Magda 
and the guy is getting ready to light the pyre on fire because he's piled up wood or wood was piled up and he's put gasoline all over it. And so he lights the stick on fire and he and Nick have a brief duke it out. Scuffle. Scuffle, kerfuffle. And Nick punches him and when he falls down, the stick lands. Nick punches him into the pile. Into the pile with the flaming wood. stick, which immediately lights it on fire. <sighs> Great aim, Nick. Yeah. So then Nick has to like, he has to montage, reclaim his faith to be able to jump over these flames. Right. We hear words of wisdom from Joan of Arc about the strength of true faith. Even yeah. though in the previous episode, he had just leaped over flames. He gets to leap over flames again, except this time he has to hear Joan of Arc's pep talk to do it. So he jumps over the flames. He gets back Magda untied and then he covers her with his coat. He like sticks his coat straight over her face and then like flies them out of the flames. Like maybe if she can't see what's going on, she won't notice that they ended up like 15 feet away from the burning wood. She's like, how'd you do that? And he goes. A little bit of adrenaline. Faith. He got mad jump. Yeah, because a little bit of adrenaline and a lot of faith. And then we kind of have a Mia culpa scene between both Father Rochefort and Detective Knight, Nick Knight, because the bad guy's caught. He's not protecting him from the sanctity of the confession anymore, so they can kind of pal it out a little bit. So the Father Rochefort apologizes to Nick, and Nick apologizes to him, and we kind of have like a... Everybody has averted their moral crises. Yeah, and Nick is kind of... He's, he's, he's got back a little bit of what he had. A little chunk of faith. Tiny little piece of And maybe of it. something else. Maybe something else, because when he gets a... Uh, Father Rochefort hands him a cross. And at first he won't take it, but then he does take it. No, it's um, Magda. Magda oh, yeah. gives Magda Nick hands in the cross. Her cross. Yeah. She's like, here, you, you, you take this. Oh, no, I can't. Yeah. He's like, oh, no, no, thanks. And we like, like zoom I in on their hands. Can't. We like zoom in in their hands and he does this like, no, I can't. Like hand wavy thing. Um, and then he ends up taking it anyway because she insists. But then he goes out to the booking area, like the main entrance lobby of the precinct. And uh, he shows his hand to Natalie. And she ends up taking the cross out of it. And she's like, well, that's not so bad. He's like, well, yeah, it's better. I mean, literally, he knows that in the past he's burst into flames. So anything's better. He says it's uncomfortable, but it's bearable. And then Skanky tries to invite him out to dinner. And that's when we get the can't. Dawn's coming. And he like, the sun's coming, the sun's up. coming up. And he chucks his dark sunglasses on. That's the end of For I Have Sinned. This is really kind of the first episode of Forever Night. I mean, it's our third episode, but the first two were really just a rehash of uh, the the done pilot. So right, the pilot doesn't always count as the plot of the first season. Yeah. So how do you feel going into episode three, season one of Forever Night? It's good. There's a little more character development for Nick, um, and yeah, uh, like everybody's getting into their character chemistry already. Although we didn't really see much of Natalie, but um, she's there in the background. A few she's times. there. She's there to be explained to. She's there to have stuff explained to her. So yeah. Nick has someone to talk to. So we have a justification for all of his flashbacks. How about you? How do you feel about I mean, season one, episode three? Do you know how many times I've seen these? I mean, this show feels like coming home every time I watch it because I've seen it so many times and I just, Love it every single time I watch it. I watched it originally in syndication. I'm not old enough to have watched it when it first aired. Or I was old enough to have watched it, but no one would have let me. I wouldn't have been old enough. Uh, so I watched it in syndication on Sci-Fi, back when Sci-Fi was spelled S-C-I-F-I, and had the little planet. And there was actually a marathon. Do you remember marathons? Uh, now we just call them binge watching right but you can do it all the time this was like oh my god i turned to my my favorite station and they're showing my favorite show and they're going to be showing it all day long and there's the possibility i'm going to see an episode that i missed yeah 
so mar- they had a marathon because they were just they were going to start showing it. So they, as a way of introducing it to the station, they had a marathon. And uh, Garrett, when Davies did like a in the commercial break or when we came back from the commercial break, he would have a little uh, like interlude where he'd give trivia or he'd talk about interesting stuff about the show. My sister put it on for me and she was like, you'll like this. It's a vampire television show. And I was like, salt. Set you on the path. Salt. (laughs) So I I sat and watched it all day long. And Mom and Dad must have been somewhere because they wouldn't have let me sit and watch it all day long. Because, of course, well, there was one TV, one station. There was no, if if nobody wanted to watch what you were watching, you didn't get to watch it. Uh, But I watched the whole thing. And then it would come on at noon. And they called it um, A Little Midnight in Your Day Life. And they would show Forever Night back to back with Dark Shadows. And I would record it while I was at school and watch it on a VHS when I came home. And you were the only one in the house that knew how to program the VCR. Right. So nobody could, un- I mean, nobody knew I was doing it, <laughs> which is probably good because I wasn't really supposed to watch a lot of vampire stuff. But I had the entire series on tape and I would label it by both the episode name and the flashback. So it would be like for I had Interesting sent and Joan Arc. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like the, fla- the flashbacks were always my favorite. In fact, there's one episode which... I think it's season one, but it's called 1966, and it's actually more flashback than it is modern day. It was one of my favorite episodes. But, yeah, so I guess that's my <laughs> my take on it. But I'm excited to be watching it with you because I know you know I like it. I know you've seen a couple of my favorite episodes, but you've never watched the entire right, show. Right, we haven't committed to watching yeah, it Yeah, we haven't committed, which I think older television shows get a bad rap. I mean, they get this idea that they're not as interesting or they're not whatever. But you just have to remember these television shows did not have the budget that modern day TV shows did. They were not the, it was not tiny cinema like it is now. I mean, television was treated completely differently. But that doesn't mean the writing isn't as good. You just have to look past the, the special effects. Especially when we get into later seasons or later episodes when we get more Lacroix. And Lacroix's lines are always like, they are always on point. Always amazing and it's such a joy to watch and it's just i don't know it's comforting to watch a show that you've loved and you've watched and you've watched a hundred times and every time you watch it it's going to be just as good all right well that was episode three season one of forever night so we'll be tackling episode four next of course Uh, if anybody wants to just go ahead and watch the whole season i highly recommend it it's good. We're going to go through the whole season anyway. Uh, that way you'll be prepared. Because, of course, we don't try to be spoiler-free. On the Strange and Beautiful Book Club, we just roll with it. Rachel's always making foreshadowing references. I am. I'm gonna. Sorry. It's just who I am. I love it. Like, I love the breadcrumbs that they put. And I love knowing where we're going. That's all part of the enjoyment. Which is why I can't help but share it. I'm also a terrible gift giver. That person that brings the gift home, and I'm like, I bought you a gift. And then five minutes later, I'm like, do you want to know what it is? (laughs) But it's fine. You just got to lean into it. I am who I am. So uh, we will be watching Legend next. But I have discovered that the theatrical version of Legend and the director's cut of Legend have different soundtracks. So now we have to watch both of them because I have to have both experiences here, because I've only ever watched the director's cut. Right, the director's cut, uh, soundtracked by Jerry, Jerry Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Yes. And then the theatrical release by Tangerine, Tangerine Dream. Dream. I mean, I'm looking forward to this, because I've only ever watched the director's cut, so we have the nice Jerry Goldsmith, well done, you know, orchestral. Right, and the one I always watched growing up was the theatrical release. So you played a couple songs and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. (laughs) That's that's bringing some stuff back. Yeah. So this this is an experience I am much looking forward to. So if you want to go ahead and watch ahead, we are going to be doing we're going to be watching and probably talking a little bit about both the theatrical version and the director's cut of Legend, which if you haven't seen Legend yet, it's a treat in its own right. So go out and find it. It's Tim Curry. Ridley Scott, Tom Cruise, Mia Sarah. I mean, it's a 
typical Ridley Scott, just like visual masterpiece. Be- just fucking yeah. beautiful. I mean, that man's an artist. So go, go forth, enjoy. And remember, sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful too. So be who you are and love what you love. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye. We gotta gotta bring it. We're here. We need we need us here. We're at a ten. I need us at an eight. I'm I'm feeding off of you, honey. <laughs> no, you are not.